Right. So, our speaker today is Amy Gabe, and his title, you can see there, is Generalized Homotisms and GK with this extra structure. Please, Jamie, go ahead. Thank you very much, and thanks for, for the invitation. So, I'm going to talk about uh, a recent project that I did with Joachim Kuntz uh, about, um, well, his his picture of, of KK theory when which, which he did back in the 80s, uh, when you add extra structure to your to your Caesar algebra in a certain sense. So I should say I, I come from this uh, from a point of view of from a very, very C star algebraic point of view, where uh, where I mainly work with, with the classification of C star algebras. And often you will want to classify C star algebras with, with some extra structure. Uh, but I'll, I'll get to that. So let me just uh, start out by um, saying that uh, A and B will be separable C star algebras throughout the talk. And uh, just to give you a tiny, tiny flavor for what is uh, KK theory. So in, in KK theory, we've got KK of a pair of C star algebras, and we should think of it as uh, a sort of generalized homomorphism group of, of C star algebras. Uh, what it is, is it, it is an, some abelian group uh, consisting of, and I will be very vague right now, generalized uh, star homomorphisms from A to B uh, up to some notion of homotopy. So some sort of homotopy. I'm I'm being very very vague here to begin with, and later on I might be a little more specific what I mean by this. Uh, but this is really what you should think about is that these are are some sort of generalized homomorphisms up to some notion of homotopy. So what we're doing is some sort some sort of homotopy theory for C star algebras. So let me start out by addressing the classical construction of KK theory due to Kasparov. Uh, so, so in this case, uh, I'm going to consider a, I'm going to suppress the word Kasparov throughout and just call them AB modules. But this is, of course, very uh, abuse of, of notation, but, but I should call them Kasparov AB modules. Uh, so what is this? So it consists of essentially two things. So it is uh, a, a a pair e comma f where uh, the e is a uh, it's a direct sum of two Hilbert modules. Uh, so this is a, uh, we can think of this as a, uh, a Z mod two Z graded uh, Hilbert B module. I should maybe say uh, right Hilbert B module. Uh, with a uh, a diagonal left action of A. Oops. So the C star algebra A acts, you can just think of it as it acts on, on each of these two things separately. So you can think of it as acting uh, diagonally like this. Uh, so We've got this part of the information, and we've got this operator f, which we can split up into to, to an off-diagonal operator uh, in the bounded. So when I, I sorry, I should have 
emphasize that when I say this curly B here, I mean the adjointable operators. Let me just so these are the adjointable operators. So we've got also some off diagonal C uh, uh, off diagonal operator such that uh, this off diagonal operator almost commutes with A uh, in the sense that the commutator of F with any element in the C star algebra A is compact. And similarly, it's almost self adjoint up to multiplying with things in A again and up to compacts. And uh, it's almost a unitary, it's almost a self adjoint unitary in the same sense for all. So this should hold for all A in A. <clears throat> So this is the data of a of a Kasparov module. You've got this this A B by module, and you've got this operator f. And then the way that you construct KK theory in the classical sense is that you consider the set of all of these A B modules up to a notion of homotopies, a notion of homotopy, where a, a homotopy you can just think of it as a uh, an A C of unit interval comma B module. So these, this is how so homotopies. Uh, it just modules themselves. All right. So what I will, will like to do is I'd like to, to consider C star algebras with more structure. So sometimes uh, we don't just oops, consider C star algebras themselves. Uh, but C star algebras with some extra structure. So let me give you some examples of what I mean by extra structure. So I'm going to focus a little bit now on what do I mean by, by extra structure. So the first example, uh, I should mention, of course, that there's plenty of, before I do that, there's plenty of, of applications to, to KK theory. Um, I, 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 I should have prepared a long list of, of examples of, of how KK theory gets used, but I, I didn't prepare any, any long list of example. What I, what I would like to highlight is, is what I use it for myself, which is the classification of Seastar algebra uh, and very often um, so, so the classification of nuclear C star algebras, I should add, uh, and uh, and in that case, I will also try to relate all of these uh, these extra structure examples to the classification of C star algebras to give you a feel for where I'm coming from uh, with all of this. Let me start out with the first example. So in this example, take some second countable uh, locally compact group G and consider uh, G C star algebras. So that is uh, I C star algebras A uh, equipped with an action 
So with a G action. So this is some homomorphism from G to the automorphism group of A, where we require that the map uh, T maps to uh, alpha T of A is continuous for all elements in RC strand. So it's these are point norm continuous uh, group actions. And in this case, we can add this structure to our KK modules, uh, to our uh, to our AB modules. So we add uh, this equivariant structure, this G structure, uh, to our AB modules uh, as follows. So we are still going to be considering the same type of data that we had before. So we considered the same type of data. So let me just scroll up again. So what is it? We've got an, an AB uh, module, the, the, the uh, right Hilbert B module with a, uh, with a left action of A, and we've got this operator F. And we want to encode our group structure into to our, our AB modules. Uh, so we require uh, that, or maybe I should say we equip, or, or we consider uh, also an, a group action gamma on each of these Hilbert modules, E0 and E1, uh, such that, which are again continuous in a certain sense, uh, pointwise continuous, so that uh, it's compatible with the action in the sense that if I look at gamma t and apply it to, well, an element xi coming from either e0 or e1, uh, then I can multiply it on the left with an A and the left and the right with a B, and I just wanted to preserve the uh, the action. So if alpha was the action on A, let me just so if A was equipped with the action alpha and B was equipped with the action beta, then we just get alpha t of A, gamma t of xi, beta t B. So in this way, we've encoded uh, the group action uh, into our, our Hilbert module. And similarly, we encode the group action into our, uh, our operator F. So we, uh, we also, so similarly, so we get, And an action, well, we get an action, let me just write it as gamma twiddle from G to the automorphism group of the bounded operators on E, which is no longer point norm continuous, but point strict continuous. Uh, so there's a little topology thing going on here. So this is, uh, Point strictly continuous. Um, so we want to require that. Uh, so we require that the operator F we had before satisfies that the map T maps to gamma twiddle t of f is now non-continuous. And 
that just like before we had all of these things about the uh, the operator being almost uh, self-adjoint and almost a unitary and in say, the same way we wanted to be almost fixed by this group action in the sense that uh, if we look at gamma twiddle t of f minus f and we multiply it to an element of a then this becomes a compact element of our Hilbert matrix. Uh, so this should hold for all A and A and group elements T and G. So by considering take A G to be uh, a comma B, so maybe I should call it instead A comma alpha and B comma beta to highlight the actions. We get that by considering all of these uh, G equivariant A B modules up to homotopy and just to mention a few of the applications that's been done classically, of course, uh, the, the, the key thing is, of course, the Baumkorn conjecture, which is has to do with G algebras, with GC star algebras. But from my point of view, I'm coming from it from a more classification point of view. And so I'd like to just uh, highlight the, that there are also classification results of uh, G C star algebras, maybe I should say uh, simple nuclear, Let's just add these words, simple nuclear, and let me also say purely infinite G C star algebras. So in this case, I'm somewhat referring to my own work with, uh, with Gabor Sabo where we recently classified all uh, sufficiently well-behaved uh, amenable actions on purely infinite simple nuclear C stars. And the, the classifying invariant was equivariant KK. So this is one of the, the, the major highlights of, of extra structure on, uh, on KK theory. Uh, but let me mention a few extra examples because I'm not just uh, interested in, in group actions. I'm also interested in other ways of encoding extra structure. So the next example is uh, due to, well, partially to Kasparov, uh, but also to, to Kirchberg in the more general setting that I'm going to, to mention here. <clears throat> so in this case, we consider, instead of having a group, we now take a topological space X. So we take X to be a topological space. Uh, and whenever we have a topological space, I will write O of X to mean the set of all uh, open subsets of X as a partially ordered set, as a lattice. Uh, so if I've got a C star algebra called A, uh, then I will write I of A to be uh, the set of all closed ideals, closed two-sided ideals, uh, I guess I could have said I is a closed ideal. Uh, so, so of course, the, the, the key example to keep in mind uh, is that if, if A was uh, C0 of X for some locally compact Hausdorff space, then, uh, then there is a canonical way of identifying the ideals in the C star algebra uh, with 
the open subsets of X. And this, this goes a lot further. You can, you can actually do the same thing for any C star algebra. Uh, so in general, you always have an isomorphism between the ideal lattice and the open subsets on the primitive ideal space of A. So these are, are, are just a few things to keep in mind of how, how is there a connection between these open subsets of a topological space and the ideal lattice. So I just want to highlight, because I forgot to highlight that before, that uh, these topological spaces X I'm working with are generally not Hausdorff. If they were Hausdorff, then I would be defining some notion of continuous fields under certain assumptions, but I'm going to consider something more general. Uh, so I can also use things like the primitive ideal spaces like I use down here, which are generally non-Hausdorff spaces. So now when I've got a topological space uh, and a c star algebra, I can talk about an action. So an action of x on A, uh, and by this, what I mean is an order preserving map that goes from the open subsets of X to the ideal lattice of A. Uh, so we could call this, say, uh, Capital Psi, I guess. Yeah, so wait, wait a, a, a little question. So if A is an algebra over C0 X, then mm -hmm. you do have this. So this yes, is, yes. So like, if I was yeah. working with C of X algebras, then then I get a, an induced uh, mm -hmm. order preserving map like this. Mm -hmm. So well, let me just... Uh, uh, Mention this here, uh, e.g., if A is a C0 of X algebra, which means that there is a, a, there is a, a, a map going from C0 of X into the center of the multiplier algebra of A. Uh, a, a homomorphism, a star homomorphism, then uh, what I would do, sometimes it's required to be non-degenerate, sometimes it's not, I'm not gonna, it's not that important for this, uh, then uh, let psi of u, so psi being this order preserving map, let this be uh, the ideal in A, uh, generated by C0 of U, where we've got, so this becomes a, a, a closed ideal uh, and uh, uh, so this here becomes a closed ideal in A. So in this example, uh, how storefulness of X is not needed? Uh, well, since we're considering C0 of X, uh, uh, the, the C0 of X on a non Hausdorff space, you can always like quotient out everything that can't be distinguished, probably, I think. And you can yeah, always you can find how storefice it. You can how it, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so it's not, um, so, so this this these type of examples only really capture uh, the Hausdorff case, uh, and I would say morally, it's because it it it's somehow going through a, a commutative C-star algebra here, a commutative C-star algebra, which in its essence is uh, a, a, a continuous function of Hausdorff space. So. So in order to get the general case, you, you have to, to find a, a more flexible notion of this. And this is what is, is given 
uh, up here. <clears throat> let me just, uh, let me actually label, uh, instead of just calling them Psi, let me call it Psi A so that I can also have Psi B on a B instead. Um, so when I'm looking at, uh, at C star algebras equipped with an action of, of, a, of a topological space X, uh, I can consider a map. Uh, I, I can consider maps between such spaces. So if, uh, uh, if phi from A to B is a linear map and, uh, uh, and we've got actions uh, psi a and psi b are uh, actions of x on a respectively b, then uh, we say that phi is x equivariant if, uh, again, it preserves this, this structure, which means that, uh, that if I apply phi to any of these ideals corresponding to the open set U, then I land inside of uh, the open set in B or the, the ideal in B corresponding to U. So in this way, I get a, a nice category. And again, if, if I was working with C0 of X algebras, these would just become the, the C of X linear maps or the X linear maps. <clears throat> But sorry, but phi is not required to be a, a, a star homomorphism. Uh, in this case, I, I'm just considering linear maps because that will actually play us a, a little role later on in the talk. Uh, of course, mainly when we're talking about the category of C-star algebras, we're thinking about star homomorphisms, but but I want to make this, this notion a little more flexible so that I could use it on, say, completely positive maps would play a, an important role in the proofs, uh, but I will even consider maps that aren't positive. So, so it's... Okay, but uh, so that's one question. If, if you take the, if X is prime A. Yes. And B is A. Mm -hmm. So the linear maps that preserve the ideas, are they necessarily of some form? So, so uh, you're, you're, you're onto something very important here, which I was going to, to uh, sweep under the rug, which is that, that there is a, an important notion uh, of these type of, of, of objects, which is uh, so an important uh, construction or an important particular action is if X was, say, prim A and... Uh, uh, then there is a canonical psi a from O uh, prim a oops, to the ideals of a, which is just this canonical isomorphism I was mentioning before. Uh, and more generally, what we will often, what one often considers is just if we work in the more general case where we just have some x instead. So let me just change this to an x now. Uh, then we sometimes ask that uh, that these uh, that this here becomes an order isomorphism. And what this this what this corresponds to, if you were working with say continuous fields, is that all of the fibers are simple. Or if you were considering just ordinary C star algebras, which you should think of as being X being just a one point space, then it cor corresponds to only considering simple C star algebras. So C, C star algebras with no non trivial ideals. So in general, it's an important class of, uh, of C star algebras with an action of X, are those where this is an order isomorphism. They're usually called tight. Uh, but in general, it's important to also consider the more general notion. Uh, in the same way as even if we're only trying to classify simple C-star algebras, we still care a lot about the non-simple C-star algebras. Uh, 
Yeah, but, but I mean, is this a, a, an answer to the question, what files preserve all the ideas? Oh, uh, so so that it's it's um, not completely, uh, but but that's one thing that we then try to do is you you try to, for instance, characterize maps that that always send certain ideals to certain ideals. And and one thing that, for instance, is is obvious in in this particular case is that, which is an important again special case, uh, is that if I had some C star algebra A, then any uh, inner automorphism, for instance, would always map any ideal onto itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these things will always be uh, psi A uh, will be always be X equivariant. Yeah, but they are also star homomorphisms. So these are, are, are very nice star homomorphisms, of course, uh, from A to itself. And and the thing is that very often uh, when we're doing classification type results, we're trying to classify uh, maps up to being able to say, when are they approximately mm -hmm. on this one? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this really plays an important role. And that's so that's also one way that these things are coming up is that it's very important to know that these inner automorphisms are always x equivariant. So let me see. So uh, when we're defining KK theory for such C star algebras with an action of x. We, again, what we do is we equip uh, the our Kasparov modules, our AB modules uh, with extra structure. So we consider uh, AB modules, EF, uh, such that, uh, that what happens is we want to to encode again this this structure and the way we encode it is by requiring that if I take any of these ideals psi a of u in a and I multiply it with anything from my Hilbert module on the left then I should always land inside of what I would get if I multiplied my Hilbert module with the corresponding ideal in B from the right. So this should hold for all U in the open set. <clears throat> and uh, I'm just going to say this out loud and, and not spend time on it. But but one of the applications in this case, when you're corresponding, when you're considering uh, ideals in the C star algebra is that you can classify non-simple Z-star algebras as well. Uh, and this was Kirchberg's motivation for, for introducing so, and for generalizing this notion of Kasparov. All right, so let me go to the third and final uh, example, which is due to Skandalis. And in this case, uh, this case will, won't take quite as long uh, to, to go through, luckily enough, because otherwise I would run out of time before I even get to my, my own theorems. Um, so if we've got, again, I'm going to work with linear maps. So if I've got a linear map between C star algebras, A and B, uh, we say that it is nuclear if so very often nuclearity is only defined for completely positive maps, but it can also be done for, for linear maps and PCA does it very nicely in, in his book on operator spaces. Uh, so what the condition I'm going to go with is that if there exists some constant, let's call it K, uh, greater than zero, uh, such that the following holds that for any C star algebra D and any finite number of elements A1 to An in A and D1 
to dn in d, so the same number of elements, one has the following inequality, that if I look at the sum of phi of ai tensor these di's, and I'm considering this sum in the maximal tensor norm of b and d, then this is less than or equal to this constant k uh, times, again, the norm from 1 to n of ai tensor di, but this time in the minimal tensor product of d. <clears throat> so uh, in particular, it, any nuclear map will be completely bounded is uh, easy to see because uh, that's equivalent to having the minimal tensor product on both the left and right side, but uh, but of course the maximal tensor product dominates the minimal one. So this is stronger. So this is a stronger notion than uh, complete boundedness. <clears throat> so what we are going to do now is when I'm just given two C-star algebras and no extra structure on the C-star algebras, I can still consider KK with a little touch of extra structure coming from this nuclearity. And what it is, is that we consider AB modules, again, uh, EF, such that uh, the map I get from, so I take, I get a map from A to B given by taking inner products with A and a vector Xi. So this is for any Xi in, in E. So I get a map that goes from A to B. So this is just, I apply this inner product. This gives me some, in, in this case, it's a completely positive map. Uh, and I want this map to be, uh, oops, so this map should be nuclear for all uh, Xi. And then again, homotopies that preserve this type of, of structure. So one application that that this has is that it allows us to extend classification results from not from uh, instead of having classification of nuclear C star algebras, we have classification of nuclear star homomorphisms from A to B. So we get we can, for instance, uh, classify inclusions of of C star algebras as long as these inclusions are on nuclear in certain cases, I should say, in special cases. So that brings me to uh, to the topic of, of my talk here, which is that uh, all of these, these uh, approaches always use the classical picture of KK theory. Uh, and Joachim Kuhns has this very nice uh, classical, or this very nice approach to KK theory using a certain universal algebra. So let me just uh, remind you what this is. So uh, we consider A free product A, uh, which is just the universal free product of the C-star algebra A with itself. Uh, and it comes equipped with two inclusions Uh, epsilon zero and epsilon one, which go from A to this free product. So the, the first and the second couple. <clears throat> and, and what we get is we have a nice canonical surjection, which is given by taking the free product of the identity map with itself. This gives me a star homomorphism to A. It's clearly surjective. And the kernel of this is this universal 
C star algebra, little q of a. Uh, and uh, which is the uh, closed ideal generated by all elements of the form epsilon zero of a minus epsilon one of a. Uh, <clears throat> so let me just introduce some notation because it will play a role in, in a moment. So let Q epsilon be the linear map. And that's why I've kept talking about linear maps is because we've got a canonical linear map going from A to little Q of A, uh, which is uh, exactly the thing I wrote above. Little Q of A uh, is epsilon zero of A minus epsilon one of A. And this will uh, play an important role when we uh, try to develop KK theory using uh, with this extra structure. So just to uh, mention this classical theorem of Kuntz from the 80s uh, is that KK A of B can be considered as uh, homo homotopy classes of honest to God star homomorphisms from A, Q of A to uh, B tensor, the compact operators on a separable infinite dimensional Hilbert space. So here uh, I mean homotopy classes oops, of honest to God star homomorphisms. And what uh, what Joachim Kuntz and I set out to do was to try to give similar a similar description of how do we express uh, these variations of KK theory in this picture. <clears throat> so uh, let me start by addressing KKX. I'm going to skip equivariant KK theory. This was classically, uh, it was already done by Ralph Meyer uh, over 20 years ago when we, we gave a, a new approach to this. Uh, but I'm going to skip the G equivariant case and focus on the others because I think there's a nice little uh, thing happening here that I'd like to highlight. Uh, so in this case, let me just, uh, so if we've got A with some action uh, of this topological space X, then uh, we get, I should have said for this, we get uh, an induced action uh, of uh, X on little Q of A by the following. Uh, so we have Let's call it psi little q of a of u. So this should be some ideal in little q of a. I'm going to define it in this universal free product upstairs because little q of a is a uh, is a an ideal in this free product. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take little q of a and just intersect it with the kernel of the canonical map that goes from a free product a to uh, a mod a of uh, a mod psi a of u free product a mod psi a of u. <clears throat> and what we proved in this case, is that KKX of A psi of A to uh, B psi B is just isomorphic to the equivariant maps from uh, 
with respect to this action. So you'd be center K, and when you're centering with, with the compact, you also get an induced action of B tensor K. So you just get uh, X equivariant homomorphisms uh, of this type. And, <clears throat> and what I would like to, to highlight is one thing because of course it it seems pretty unpractic impractical to to compute these ideals in little q of a but a nice little thing is that uh, a star homomorphism phi from q of a to b is x equivariant with respect to these actions if and only if by composed with this little q epsilon map, which is now a linear map that goes from A to B, uh, is equivalent. And, uh, and we can actually do a similar thing in the nuclear case. So let me just end with uh, KK nuke. So in this case, if we've got uh, a homomorphism, or a star homomorphism from little q of a to b, we say that it is q nuclear if uh, phi composed with little uh, q epsilon, which is a map again from a to b, is nuclear. And what we proved is that KK nuke AB is just canonically isomorphic to the set of all Q nuclear maps up to home token. So the thing I want to, to highlight, I was going to, to sketch a little proof of this, but I, I ran out of time, uh, is that it really seems like a lot of these things, this extra structure is captured by composing with this little Q epsilon map. Uh, and I think that, that there's a lot more to, to explore here in the sense of, of exactly why is it enough that we can capture all of this extra structure by by just uh, tagging on this little extra linear map um, but i am going to to stop here so thank you very much so thank you jamie for a very nice talk um are there questions from the audience Well, let me ask a question then. Yeah. Um, how about the universal property of these equivariant KK yeah. theories? This should follow from this Kunz picture? Yes, indeed. So so uh, the, the X equivariant version follows uh, immediately from this picture as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, and this, the, we also do a version for uh, KKG where it also, which which you also did uh, uh -huh. like in the early two thousands, and uh, and again it the, the the universal property follows almost immediately from this. Uh -huh. Does uh, KK nuke have some universal property? No, I wouldn't does, know about that. Um... <laughs> well, not any that we know of, and I think that the uh -huh. the issue is that that we we don't have enough. Well, the uh, I think the one of the key property, uh, problems is that that if you're looking at C-star algebras where with arrows between them which are all nuclear, then this is not a category. This is kind of it's an ideal in a category more than a category itself. Um, uh -huh. So, yes. so it, it it kind of it, it's hard to to pinpoint exactly what this universal property should be in this case. Yeah. And uh, and yeah. I definitely don't know what it is fair enough i don't know either 
No, I, I think that just to, to return to it, I think that it's because in for KK Nuke, one shouldn't actually think of KK Nuke as arrows in a category. One should instead think of it as a a, a bifunctor on KK. Uh, and uh, and in this case, uh, you uh, you can say certain things like, uh, for instance, if you if you hold uh, the the C star algebra A, uh, if you fix the C star algebra A and consider it as a functor in the second variable, it actually becomes an exact functor. Uh, it maps short exact sequences to short exact uh, to long exact sequences, um, which was proved by Skandalis in his original work. So so you have some nice property there, even though it's not itself arrows in a in a nice. Uh, in a nice category. Okay. So yeah, well, uh, Ralph stole my one of my questions. But sorry uh, for that. <laughs> but um, yeah. So along the same, the same kind of ideas. So of course, I mean, to my point of view. Uh, results such as these uh, are very nice because they give a much nicer description than the original one. Uh, but <clears throat> in practice, say if you if you uh, want to classify algebras, sister algebras with a given uh, over X, so that they have they give them poset of ideas. Mm -hmm. um, do you actually use the, the what the the elements of KK are or just the universal properties? So uh, for the point of classification, it's very important to actually work a little more with these quasi-homomorphisms. Uh, it's I, I definitely yeah. don't see how one would would derive the type of things we derive without uh, without the, the the framework that lies behind it, uh, which is all yeah. related to notions of like Voiculescu's theorem, uh, Voiculescu's absorption theorem, and things like this. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, you do use quasi homomorphisms, but I, I mm -hmm. use that too. But uh, I mean, the fact. I mean, you eventually. Perhaps you you want to say, yeah, maybe maybe I mean in the in the simple cases you end up uh, showing that for the algebras you're interested in, uh, every class comes from a homomorphism. Mm -hmm. It's uh, yeah, and uh, and then the kind of elements you handle are all come some way or another from a quasi homomorphism. Yeah. So okay, so this theorem tells you that they are all. That's all there is. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, and uh, I mean, uh, before this, did you or are there results uh, about the classification over and over the SpaceX? That actually use the original Kasparov picture and can run. So, so all of the original results use the the original mm -hmm. uh, Kasparov picture to some extent. Often you will uh, there's been other types of simplifications. Mm -hmm. uh, so I I gave a a new proof of of Kirchberg's classification of non simple C star algebras back uh, some years ago, and and what I ended up developing was. So I, I found a completely different approach to it, and uh, and it it went through a a notion of of quasi homomorphisms in a similar way as here, but but where it was important to work with the pair of homomorphisms and not the little Q construction, and it and it actually was because of a little remark that I put in that paper that that Kuhn's, uh, wrote me an email and said. Surely you can just do the same thing that that I did in the eighties, and uh, and I was like, I don't see actually immediately how how to do it, and uh, 
And that was how that, that ball started rolling was that, that I could simplify it a lot of the way to, to his picture, but not the entire way. Uh, so that was uh, why we, we decided to, to try to see, because it was also, it's a, it's a very nice picture. And, uh, and for instance, we, I'm going to use this, uh, this last version for KK Nuke in a, an upcoming paper with, uh, Chris Schaffhauser, Aaron Tigrisi, Stuart White, and Jose Carrion, mm -hmm. uh, which again, it it wasn't necessary, but it it, it allows us to shave off ten pages of of KK computations uh, to just be. It follows obviously that <laughs> that this holds. You said before that you that KK Nook was more like an idea, but I mean. Uh, the way yeah. I understand ideas in categories are close not only under composition between themselves, arrows in the category, but also the arrows on our side. So and and that's actually true in this case as well. Uh, and it's it's not at all obvious. But if you, that's also something we we prove. Uh, Kunz and I, it was already again it was known uh, from from Skandalis, but. Uh, but if we, because we also construct the Kasparov product in, in this case and show that the Kasparov products are well behaved. And one thing we, for instance, prove is that if you take the Kasparov product of a KK nuke element with an ordinary KK element, you get a KK nuke element. So they actually do multiply into these, uh, these ideals. But, but then, but it, I mean, but then if you take two of them and you multiply, you get another one of them. Yeah, yeah, you, you. Why, why is it not a category? Sorry. Why is it not a category? Ah, uh, because the identity is not there. You don't have identities. Yeah. Ah, well. Yeah. It's like <laughs> saying that something is not a ring because it doesn't have a what. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But but it really does does uh, like make some certain things a bit uh, weirdly behave and uh, and we don't have a. A, a super nice theory for it and i think one of the reasons is that that there aren't identities and the moment you have an identity then the 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 c star algebra will be what we call k nuclear uh, and uh, hmm. and then and then it just turns into ordinary kk theory anyway mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> one last question on my side uh, it's not related exactly to to, to, the, to your talk, but um, um, so do you? So you know this result of Xin Li that sister uh, uh, is a group I I think I I didn't catch that completely. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, you know this. There is this result of Xin Li that uh, provides uh, a groupoid model for every classifiable, maybe classifiable simple system. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So do, do people in, in, in the world, in the classifying, the classification programs, do they really use this uh, groupoid picture or? Uh, so, so we we don't have any strong applications of that right now. What what it what it really did was it gave us a completely different formulation of the UCT problem because because there is a, a subtlety which is whether every separable nuclear C star algebra satisfies the UCT mm -hmm. and what uh, what was a, an important consequence of uh, of Shin's work is that. Uh, the UCT problem itself is it becomes equivalent to uh, does every classifiable C star algebra uh, contain a Cartan subalgebra? Because all of the ones satisfying the UCT have a Cartan subalgebra by by the work of of Shin because he showed that our groupoid models for them. So suddenly we've got a completely different approach mm -hmm. to potentially attacking the UCT problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so are there any more questions? Well, I have a question that's a bit related to the talk, namely, 
how about, how does this help to make maybe new KK theories or maybe something is already done? For instance, if you want to do non-simple real C star algebras, I'm not sure Kirchberg did this. Did he? Did you? I'm not familiar with the, with him doing real C star algebras. Yeah. And I think it would just be going through it and checking everything works, I guess. But doing this is, of course, a bit, uh, well, someone should actually check it. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, do your ideas help to simplify such arguments? I, I have not thought about that at all. Uh, uh -huh. So so I, I don't know if, uh, if that could help simplify certain things, but it's okay. definitely a, 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 nice, uh, a nice approach to... to uh, to KK theory we have here that, uh, and, uh -huh. and maybe again, there could be some some way of, maybe again, it would be this little Q epsilon map that could help encode some of the extra structure that's needed. Uh, I don't know, but uh, but maybe there's something there. I, I, but I'm not, I haven't thought about that at all. Okay, and you don't plan to do this in the near future, I guess? I have no, uh, applications to, to real C star algebras in, in any near future that I can think okay. of. Okay, fair enough. Um... So uh, Ralph just got a, a subject to give one of his, his students as a pro. Well, well, this is not the ideal subject for a student because you have to know quite a lot um, to even start on this. And then if you know that much, you might want something more exciting than checking that something expected does work. Um, you have to have a very good student, maybe you have to have some result which is deeper, which uses this real KK theory, and then it would become worthwhile. But let's see whether this occasion arises eventually. Now, I was just wondering if maybe, uh, you know, some of these same ideas apply to E-theory as well as KK. So basically you have to replace quasi homomorphisms by asymptotic homomorphisms, but otherwise, a lot of the theory is rather similar. So has anybody worked out the sort of X equivariant version of E theory? And presumably a lot of what you did here yes, could be so, used in that situation also. So the X equivariant case was done by, by Valf and Marius Dadala uh, in a paper from 2012. Um, and uh, and I, I actually used uh, some of that work in, in, uh, in a paper of my own uh, some years ago to, uh, to show that any, uh, any if, if you're working in the class of, in the nuclear C star algebra setting at least, then if you and, and your C star algebras have these tight actions between them, then any E of X equivalence can be lifted to a KKX equivalence. So you can actually classify C star algebras using E theory instead of KK theory, which I guess was somewhat expected, but uh, but uh, it required some some tricky lifting theorems where you can construct completely positive maps that that lift the ideal structure as well. Uh, so you mean so, that has been been done a, a fair bit, yeah. So there is a, a, a picture of E theory with replacing, I mean, with little Q, but instead of homotopy classes of morphisms, you will have homotopy oh, classes. I, of, I don't know if there's a little Q of, I don't know if there's a little Q of a version of, of uh, I think that there was a, a result of uh, of Tatiana Schulman that, that if you do, what is it, little Q of A is, Asymptotically equivalent to uh, to uh, the double suspension of A or something like that. Uh, so I think that there are certain things that are known also in that context, mm -hmm. but I'm not so familiar with with how the little Q of A picture works with E theory. So mm -hmm. I, I'm not completely sure how that would go. Well, my guess would be that it's not so useful to combine it with E-theory because it's really making split exactness true, but E-theory wants a bit more and first doing split exactness with little q and then doing even more with asymptotic morphisms, why do this complication? With asymptotic morphisms, you get exactness for all extensions and little q just isn't 
helping anymore, I, I mm -hmm. think. You yeah, could do it, but there is no particular need to do it. Mm -hmm. Something that would be useful is sometimes describing KK theory using E theory by completely positive asymptotic morphisms. Mm -hmm. uh, so once we have developed E theory in some context, you might then also get a KK theory for that context by just adding suitable complete positivity, maybe equivariance conditions as well, depending on how much you assume in E-theory. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that's Thomson's result, but it's also sometimes quite useful. It brings together E and KK theory. Right. More questions or shall we stop recording uh, here? Uh, Paul Meunier has a question in the chat. Um, hello. Yeah. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, if I may, I have one uh, question about how you, you were mentioning that universal property, uh, in particular in the equivariant case. So from your construction, if I, if I understood well in your, in your paper, you obtained very naturally the existence of the functor on objects, but you, you don't describe how you do it for morphisms. And a priori, you don't have a unique isomorphism on objects, so it's not canonical. I was wondering how, uh, what constructions you had in mind. Um, so I, I'm not sure if I completely understand uh, the 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 issue. So uh, so if you've got one of these these quasi homomorphisms. Uh, so if you've got a, a quasi homomorphism, say from from A to to B, you you can do this this usual construction. If if by let's say we replace B with the B zero to be the the hereditary subalgebra generated by by the image. Oops. Uh, this oops, like that. Uh, so we get these these two homomorphisms by zero and by one that go from a to the multiplier algebra of b zero and like in in the usual way that one would do this uh, out of the going through the the free product construction and uh, so what you get is uh, let me see if I can I can do it uh, without messing this up is that uh, that you you consider the uh, the short exact sequence which uh, you have b zero going into uh, well b zero plus the image of one of these to a and maybe to a quotient of a but let's just assume that it's to a okay. and then you get two different splittings here by zero and by one. And if you now apply your your functor to it, uh, you get uh, f of phi zero minus f of uh, phi one, which becomes a map on the level of functors from f of a to f of this thing here. Let me just call it e. And if this uh, extension was uh, if the functor was split exact, then it lands inside of the the image of B, and that becomes your uh, your map induced by a, a KK element. Okay, so you're saying that this works exactly the same with the group construction. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I I was not seeing it in the paper, so thanks for explaining. Yes. Okay, more questions? Otherwise, I'll stop the recording now.